Well, good morning. Good morning. Hey, you're all here. That's good and, and alert. One thing you may have noticed already is that I'm going to be preaching from here. Uh, last time I was on, by the way, Pastor has got an away wedding this weekend, so that's why I'm filling in for him. Um, last time I was preaching, I preached from there on Friday, but I preached from here on Sunday just to save my legs doing that three times. And I found it, it worked so well, you're getting it from here today also. So um, I'll be a little closer to you and hope that the service and the sermon are meaningful to you. That said, everything's in the bulletin or on the screens. Please rise for the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Yes. <laughs>
set it on a pole, and if the ser serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. But God, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, grant your pardon. Almighty and merciful Lord, grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. Then they cried to the Lord in their, in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them straightway till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing and the hungry soul, he fills with good things. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may pardon and acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
You may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday in Lent is from the 21st chapter of Numbers. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Eden. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and we loathe the worthless this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among them and bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to God that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from the second chapter of Ephesians. And you were dead in the, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgresses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in the kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not only a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the Lord be first and God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. By grace you have been saved through faith. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. I mean, you can't get any more familiar Bible passages, but that can be a problem. We often don't consider the verses on either side of them, but not today. We're going to consider some of those other verses, especially, for example, the last verse of the epistle, which points out that we are God's workmanship. And then there's the last verse of the gospel, where Jesus clearly says that whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. What comes to the light these days? You know what it is? It's all those ones and zeros that make up the records of what we've done digitally. Who hasn't Googled 
his or her own name to find out how much is up there. And that's just a little of it. There are all these information policies. But, you know, once that information is out there, you can't take it back. It's like a word out of your mouth. But think about it. Shouldn't our lives be open books? Well, of course. And that's why our politicians promise us transparency. Ah, uh, yeah. But just try to get some of that hidden information through the uh, Freedom of Information Act. Except for our previous president's tweets, much of what happens in government remains hidden from our view. Now, wishing some things weren't available for everyone to read all about it, that's not new, not really. And we see it in today's readings. For example, the Israelites in the desert. I think they would have preferred that Moses' diary read Genesis through Deuteronomy to have been put through a shredder than for each generation around the world to read about how they grumbled about the food. Oh, too bad. I mean, they had to reach all the way down to the ground to pick up the manna. And, and they probably had to hit with clubs the quail that were coming right to them every evening for dinner. And of course, if, if they were living today, well, then they'd have something to grumble about, right? I mean, the gasoline prices are starting to go up. The mail takes several days to get here from only 3,000 miles away, the other side of the country. And if you want free delivery, why? You have to pay annually to belong to Amazon Prime or Walmart Plus. Grumble, grumble. Yeah, well. In the epistle, the Christians in Ephesus, I'm sure, would have preferred also that Paul either limit his remarks to his epistle or at least give instructions to burn it after it was read. And even though he included himself, did he have to write that they once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of body and mind, and who are by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind? Well, um, since that's what the Holy Spirit inspired him to write, then uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But after all his thanksgivings for grace, Paul has to spend the rest of his epistle reminding them again and again, walk in love, put on the new self, and on and on. How embarrassing. Although today, you know, when you think about it, the very vices that he's condemning are the things that try to entice us to watch TV shows, movies, and at times even the news. Hmm. And then there's the gospel reading. In case you've forgotten, John 3.16 and the rest of it come from Nicodemus who came to Jesus under cover of night when it was dark. Now, he was a member of the ruling class, the, the Sanhedrin, and he was always vulnerable to criticism and scandal, and not to mention he could get censured by some of the other members. Were his visit found out, his political career, uh, career might have had more problems than that of Andrew Cuomo or Ted Cruz. Well, all those comparisons are just to point out that people haven't changed very much. And Jesus' words should speak to us directly today without any translation problems. Now as then, We'd rather not come to the light lest our deeds should be exposed. And you know what they are, our private emails being read, our cloud-based backups decrypted, our checkbooks published, our cell phone conversations overheard. It can all be used as evidence against us. And we all know we're guilty, along with God's Old Testament people, the church at Ephesus, and even Nicodemus. What went through your mind 
earlier, when we all confess, I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Uh, sometimes the confession is just words, and we don't even think about them. They just come out. But then some evidence of sin, like those digital records, is lurking out there somewhere, and we need to confess those. I mean, is it really forgiven? I, I think it's almost like the way we get our garbage ready. You know, we have to put it into recycling or not. But there's a big difference, which we could consider this morning. We have to separate, think about it, our physical evidence of recent days into recyclables that can be reused. Empty boxes, snail mail, broken plastics, and so on. And those that go in the garbage can, those that are destined for only burial in the landfill, spoiled food, unwanted mixed containers, stained items, and so on. Where would you put your empty promises, angry words, broken relationships, spoiled intentions, mixed messages, stained friendships? And to which court would those go? And you know, we really don't want anybody digging into either of those physical carts. Both contain evidence, not only of where you live, but a lot more. Yeah, shining a light on what we want to keep secret would be a glaring mistake. In his fanciful book, so the Screw Tape Letters, C.S. Lewis has a senior devil writing to his nephew, a junior devil, about God's light. And he reflects that humans do not start from that direct perception of him which we unhappily cannot avoid. They have never known that ghastly luminosity, that stabbing and searing glare, which makes the background of permanent pair, uh, pain in our lives. Ah, but it all depends on who is shining the light on whom. And there is a gracious surprise in store for all of God's people in history and for us today, when God exposes our lives to his light. Consider the people in those readings today. Right after our excerpt from uh, Numbers 21, there's a list of battles which the Israelites won. And at the end of them, the Lord said to Moses, do not be afraid of the king of the Amorites, for I have handed him over to you with his whole army and his land. And so they defeated him, and they possessed his land. Indeed, whenever the Israelites would look back at this part of their history, in spite of all their grumbling and complaining and errors, they would see that the evidence points directly to God and his fighting for them. It was pure grace that they had been saved. And of course, the beauty of John 3.16 is that it sets forth in no uncertain terms who did what for whom. As uh, Deaconess Karen pointed out in her online presentation of the hymn we just sang, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. The evidence of God's loving the whole world is Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, although Nicodemus came to Jesus under cover of the darkness, in the light of faith, he understood eventually about the rebirth of water and the Spirit. You might remember that it was Nicodemus who provided the costly myrrh and aloes with which the ladies were going to anoint Jesus' body on Good Friday. Imagine how he felt on Easter morning. Well, the same is true for the Ephesians. Again, that last verse in the epistle, it's remarkable. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand 
that we should walk in them. If Paul calls to remind the, uh, if he writes to remind the Ephesians about their previous condition, it's always as a contrast, a contrast to their present situation. Rather than berate them for what had been wrong way back when, he points out that their present life is indeed empowered by God. They, we, are God's workmanship. But look, God has only remade us so that we could do God good works. He's done more than that. He's even prepared beforehand for us to do them. Now, whenever I read this verse, I picture a doorway with Jesus holding the door open and inviting me to walk through. The future to which he invites us is bright with opportunity. Now, when you hold the door for somebody else to walk through, you don't thank them for putting one foot in front of the other and getting through that door. No, that person will thank you for holding the door open and, in fact, urging them to walk through. With Jesus holding the door open, we thank him for giving us whatever opportunity he has set up. And in faith, then we walk through. Again, when seen in the light of Scripture, the evidence is clear. It's always God at work. So, while we were sinners without Christ, we would have tried to avoid the glare of his light. But with the light of the gospel, we see what God has done for us. In the analogy of recycling, when God shines his light on the evidence of what we'd like to have kept under wraps, there's really nothing to hide there. No matter how we may have divided our deeds, it's all been forgiven. Not only has our Lord paid for what we'd like to think, oh, it wasn't too bad, our unfortunate thoughts, words, and deeds, he's also paid for our faults, our own faults our own most grievous faults. And like that recycling truck's extended arms, our Lord took them all up to the cross, to his own recycling plant, the cross and empty tomb. We haven't done anything. It's pure grace. And just as used aluminum and paper are available for new uses, so we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And just what are those works? Remember that right after our confession at the beginning of this service, we said to one another, the almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. We said that because we know he's done that already for each of us. And as his workmanship, the door that he holds open for us primarily is to go and forgive each other and perhaps people who think that part or all of their lives are like that spiritual garbage cart, unforgiven or unforgivable. Now, it might seem a little unusual and out of place on a day when a Lutheran text, saved by grace, is read. But there is this interesting example of someone trying to walk through that door. Yeah, it was the Pope of all people. He went to Iraq last week. He held a mass in Mosul and then preached in nearby Karakash, where there he is preaching by a destroyed church building. What did he say? The road to a full recovery may still be long, but I ask you please not to grow discouraged. What is needed is the ability to forgive, but also the courage to not give up. He came so close, but he didn't say was that because of Christ's death and resurrection, they had been given that opportunity to forgive. He left out the cross. He didn't lift high the cross, as we sang at the beginning of this service. And many of them, I'm sure, did not realize they'd all been forgiven for everything. 
And when we contact and, and meet other people, not everyone realizes or believes that today. You need not hope, however, that your friend is going to find some other evidence for possible forgiveness. Since you have become God's workmanship, you are living, breathing evidence. And as that evidence, what door might our Lord open inviting you to walk through? Might it mean going to a friend or family member, bringing him or her your and God's pardon and forgiveness? Might it mean an unexpected moment when you could exhibit God's forgiveness? I don't know what he's got in store. But whenever that door opens, how about being the evidence and telling them through your words and deeds that God so loved the world that they have been saved by grace through faith. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Please rise, we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us pray for the church here and around the world and for all people in their various circumstances. When the Israelites became impatient, they spoke against God and against Moses. Let us pray for all who are in positions of authority in our nation and others, that God would give them wisdom to seek ways to meet the needs of their citizens providing for equal justice and stability for everyone within their borders. And let us pray for police and armed forces that God would protect them as they maintain security and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Many people follow the course of this world, carrying out their desires by nature, children of wrath. Let us pray for people who influence our culture and society but without faith in our Savior, that God would open their eyes to look up to Christ on the cross, working faith in their hearts and making them alive together with Christ. And let us pray for lay and clergy leaders of the church here and around the world, that God would give them, their, give them strength and opportunity to spread the gospel with joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. When the Israelites were in the wilderness without food and water, God provided manna. Let us pray for all who lack adequate food, 
clothing and shelter, that he would provide opportunities for individuals and organizations to channel the resources he provides to where they are most needed. And let us pray that all who manage God's bounty, serving him so that it moves from mine, mine to tool, from farm to table, from warehouse to storefront, storefront, and from street to home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The psalmist remembered that when they cried to the Lord in their trouble, he delivered them from their distress. Let us pray for all who are troubled in body, mind, or spirit, both those near and dear to us, especially David, Donna and Fred, Terry, the two Peggies, Carol, Ken, Sammy, Erlene, Lisa and her son Matt, Martha Sylvester's sister, Carolyn, Max Hearn's mother, Betty, George Jenkins' friend, John's niece, Dawn, Shirley Marquardt's nephew, Tony, his wife, Katie, and their unborn baby, the Swenson's friend, Ed, Richard, Jose, and his wife, Tracy, the gardener's neighbor, Adrian, Sam Brand's mother, Lori, Margaret Salo's son, Eric, Ms. Wiki's friends, John and Barbara, and Barbara Watson's husband, Michael, and those known only to God, that he would bring about healing, relief, comfort, and peace as it fits his gracious plans for them. And let us pray for ourselves and all who care for the sick and dying, that we serve our gracious God using the gifts he provides. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, Heavenly Father, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Closing him, my faith looks up to thee.
few announcements for today. Uh, Young at Heart will be meeting this coming week uh, for a lunch and learn. We're going to uh, eat lunch at 11 a.m. and then we're going to have a program on the food traditions of Lent. There's a lot of them in the history of the church, so that should be interesting. If you'd like to come and uh, attend that lunch, there is a sign-up sheet in the narthex. Um, the virtual joy event is coming up uh, for LWML. That will be next Saturday in the morning. Uh, also happening next Saturday is a virtual cooking class. If you're interested in either of those, the information is in your announcement page, um, and you can ask me any questions. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet for the joy event in the narthex. And then if you're uh, looking for something to do uh, to serve the Lord as we depart today, uh, the property committee is having a church work day on March 27th from 8 a.m. until they're done with all their work. So who knows, 8 p.m. maybe. <laughs> but uh, you guys are welcome to stop in uh, and help with that. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, go in peace as you serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.